point where more people will be able to partake those who can invest the kind of money that's going to be required to do it. But I know the cost has come down considerably. There's certain things, technologies have improved. It's almost like we look at the computer age and I come back from, you know, pre-internet and it's like, wow, you know, you just see the things developing rapidly, almost month by month, not, not waiting years now, months, and there's clinical trials going on right now that are quite exciting, right? Yeah, there really is. And what our company is doing that's a little bit different, BioViva is actually working to create a platform so that we can expedite drugs uh, to the regulatory process. So how will we do that? We look at gene therapies that create regeneration in the body that sometimes have decades worth of research and human tissue toxicity data. We're expediting the use to patients uh, through a company called Integrative Health Systems that give patients access to gene therapy now. Now what we do as a company, BioViva just analyzes the data. So we look at the before data, exactly what the patient did, and the post data. We're hoping to be able to slap down evidence on each one of these gene therapies, and there's about 10 that we're looking at that cause regeneration in different ways, uh, onto investors' deck and show them that the 94% failure rate of drug development of the past is over because we will actually have the perfect model organism for testing these drugs, which are human bodies. Yeah, I, I think there's been a little bit too much effort put into animal studies and humans react differently. We have a much more complex biology. So it's great that you're, you're going in that direction because, you know, I mean, we, we all have a decision to make, right? I mean, we either age as our prior generations did or we come about and take this by the bull by the horns, as you will, and we, we take action and intervene. I mean, that's what the whole uh, science of bioidentical hormonal intervention started. That's what we're, we're looking at stem cell intervention. So the gene therapy uh, might be able to bypass some of the limitations of lengthy chromosomes and telomeres and so forth, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're looking at therapies that do different things. And, and going back to what you're talking about risk, life is risky. Uh, aging comes with a 100% mortality rate. And we can't live in denial of this anymore. And actually, by treating biological aging, we're helping kids find cures for their diseases. Almost every gene therapy that we look at actually correlates to helping kids live longer that have complex disease. So we can actually help the whole world by moving forward. But life is risky. We have to be aware of that. And while we still are viable, before it's too late, we need to partake in, in, in driving this medicine forward. So some of the therapies that we look at, essentially we're trying to tackle the hallmarks of aging. So we call aging a disease, biological aging, not chronological aging. We want you to get older by years. But we call biological aging a disease. But actually what biological aging is, is a bunch of different hallmarks of an aging cell. So the real diseases are things like mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, stem cell depletion, intra and extracellular communication issues where we build up things like glycasia. And that means uh, misfolded proteins that get all gummed up and they stop the, the body's ability for the cells to uh, communicate with each other accurately and clear that damage. So there's several hallmarks that will be the diseases of the future. So in the future, Alzheimer's is just a symptom of, of several of these hallmarks of aging. It's glycation, which we think of as beta amyloid plaques, and it's irregular cellular intercommunication and things like that. But that's all the aging process. So by tackling that, we can actually cure this disease or this multitude of disease. But I think it's going to be several genes. And so we're looking at telomerase induction for lengthening the ends of the chromosomes. We're looking at PGC1-alpha for really healthy mitochondria. Uh, we're looking at myostatin inhibitors uh, because they increase muscle mass. They've been used in over 30 patients and they, they predictably increase muscle mass. Uh, and that actually helps uh, protect against frailty and type 2 diabetes. Sarcopenia. Yeah, exactly. Major cause of death. We're looking at the goddess Clotho, all bow down. Clotho is a gene that spins the thread of life. And it actually is a gene that protects the kidneys against kidney damage. It was found when people with renal failure, which is one in seven people over the age of 65, were found to have low levels of the protein. With upregulation of the protein in animal models, they live 30% longer and their kidneys regenerate. So when we just look at these four genes, we're already on to something. We're looking at six more. And, and I, it's important for our audience to recognize that 
we're not looking at this as a silver bullet because no. we want people to be on a healthy, healthy lifestyle. We know that Dr. Kempner published his results at Duke University with people who had kidney failure, and he put them on essentially a whole food, you know, rice fruit diet, and essentially because it was low protein, they no longer had the toxicity that that yeah, had caused their kidney failure. Exercise and and eating right are, are the first lines of intervention. But remember, there are a lot of people in this country alone who have let things go so far oh, that with the true. ability to take a few injections of a gene therapy and to significantly decrease their white fat and increase their muscle mass helps them get motivated to help themselves. I totally agree. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's discouraging. You hear people, I look, I go to the gym, I work out, I no longer get the gains that I did, and I'm, I'm losing ground. And, yeah. you know, part of it, hormonal, genetic, I mean, you, you look at people with a fabulous body. They didn't get a fabulous body just because they worked out. They had genetics leading in. Arnold would be the first oh, yeah. to tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you have to take that into account. But these uh, particular interventions, uh, I mean, it's it, I've been reading about it for a long time and looking at it and going, wow, that, that makes it easier. Because these protein peptides work, the bioidentical hormones work, the nutritional intervention works, good quality sleep. You know, these are the core. But if we can just get that edge, right? Because yeah. we got to get into that last quarter. I mean, this is going to be right. tough this last quarter when, when we're trying to get Life past that. code and we rewrite it, we, we readjust those proteins. And the great thing about gene therapy is one treatment for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of technology that we're looking at instead of, you know, all of the things that we ingest that might have an off-target effect. If we just affect the proteins at the cellular level that we want to upregulate, there are not the harmful effects maybe to the liver and the kidneys and and various things like that, where people are taking prescription medicine to try to fight off the symptoms of a disease. So it's like a losing battle. You're already in a losing battle, and then you're 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 actually creating uh, diseases that run in tangent with your losing battle. Yeah, I've taken some of the doctors I work with and been called into very difficult, challenging cases where the person uh, you hear that you know they're having uh, certain uh, edema problems and other issues, so they're given diuretics and then they're cause other side effects and, and so their cause of death isn't necessarily the original condition it's just they didn't know how to intervene and yeah. the cause of death one of the leading causes of death is drug prescribed that yeah. was uh, you know certainly we, we have a problem. an amazing sick care system yeah. we do sick care we wait for people to get mm -hmm. sick and then we start battling their symptoms but what we really need is actual health care so we need to get in there long before one of the interesting things that you can find on the CDC is the U.S. is 5% of the world's population. We take 75% of the whole world's prescription drugs and we have the shortest lifespan of all the OECD countries. The shortest lifespan. So we know that that's inequitable health care as well, but, but I think those drugs are playing into it. You know, we right. don't have safe drugs. The FDA keeps saying we want safe drugs. How do you get safe drugs? You need human data to get safe drugs. And you need drug companies that don't hide data. You know, so when you get a statin, you're going to help 1 in 164 people not have a stroke, but 1 in 10 of them will get type 2 diabetes, and 1 in 50 will get dementia caused by those drugs. Right. I'm not saying don't take your prescription drugs. I'm just saying become educated in what you're already doing. And, and there may be an herbal supplemental intervention that at least is benign and safe, and at very best there's some data that shows these things from generation after generation. Herbs have been used as a medicine for, for generations and worked. So if we're going to use the gene therapy, and we know of uh, certain genes that will work, uh, can a, a, a cocktail, or would you want to intervene at one gene at a time, see how it works for about three months, and then go into the next? So how we're designed is we don't believe in a silver bullet. So we know that it's going to be a multitude of genes. Right now, AAB gene therapy gets one little piece of a gene in really well. And so there's 140 clinical trials going on with that, that gene viral vector that to get genes into the system. We're working on a viral vector now in research and development that can get four, five, or six genes, depending on the size, whole genes into the body with a promoter. So we're working on building the first artificial human chromosome. The first artificial human chromosome that will have a string of genes that are to promote health. But while that's being developed in tangent, we'll be running data on one gene at a time so that we can understand where they work, what the benefits are, or if they work at all. 
So the best thing you can do is don't fall in love with her hypothesis. Don't get stuck on telomere lengthening. Don't get stuck on mitochondrial health. Just try to see what the data says and then go from there. So that's why we don't develop one drug because the, the, minute, the minute you do that, you're in love with your hypothesis and you are going to prove that it works even if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, at, at a very serious price. So when you're looking to the future then, what do you envision? Uh, what will it take uh, in terms of the computer power, the, the human power, the science coming together? There's getting a lot of excitement about this whole uh, concept of let's defeat aging as we know it, isn't there? Oh yeah, so what we're going to do now is our offshore patients are already going through the system. Okay. Our onshore company, uh, the data analytics, is looking at that data and analyzing that. And we need to see you know, what therapies work and where they work. And then what we really need to do is then get these drugs into a more serious regulatory system where they can run through while still having them available for patients and patients. Patients come first, data comes first. That data helps biotech companies uh, get the investment they need and it helps investors de-risk the investment. 94% failure rate going through the FDA. So you put a half a billion dollars into a drug and it's, it has a 94% failure rate. Why would people do that? We need a better drug development platform. We're trying to help with that. We believe that these therapies will start helping. Hopefully within a year we'll have some insight on what ones work best, but I think it'll be you know five, six, eight, ten years, and then we'll start to create predictive, predictive therapeutics for people, and that's really what you want. Right, and so are there those that are concerned about, uh, say, certain side effects with gene therapy, and if those are of concern, how do you view that right now? Right, so Right now, 140 clinical trials with AAB, and we're not seeing bad side effects. They did have some, some issues in treating cancer because we're looking at immune modulation uh, therapeutics. And if you give too high of a dose of gene therapy, there is a limit that the body can handle, and how we're adapting to that is using immune suppressions when a person uh, does a gene therapy. So there are some hurdles. And even when we know the genes that work, we have to work on the titration level, meaning how much per body weight does each person need. So there are definitely some hurdles in the technology. This is not overnight technology. So we need people to share the information, become excited, and demand that they get access to this type of technology. Fantastic. So some of the conditions that might be helped in the near future, what are you envisioning that we were to look at that and consider the data, uh, urological research, joint problems, uh, organ failures. Give me kind of a general idea of what, what we're looking at in the near future. Right, so with gene therapy, we'll be looking at clotho treating kidneys. So we're, we'll hopefully be looking at people with renal failure uh, becoming healthier and coming out of the disease state. That, that would be the big hope. With the mitochondrial uh, dysfunction type gene therapies, maybe we'll be able to treat things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, with telomerase induction, we're hoping for a general uh, protection against aging and maybe even a protection against cancer. And with the myostatin inhibitors, we're looking to stop frailty. We're looking to stop sarcopenia and help patients who have taken cancer therapies with cachexia, which is another form of muscle wasting. And of course, what it was developed for to begin with is creating cost-effective machines and Becker's muscular dystrophy tra treatments for people in the when I worked in uh, some of the critical care units and physical therapy, uh, when I was a postgraduate student at USC, I, I remember, you know, the, the very troubling issues of uh, various types of uh, neurological disorders and damages and cerebral palsy uh, yeah. and you know, children just disfigured and problems. And, and I, I just see the suffering that people go through. And people don't realize, you know, it, it, this this is a noble mission. You know, yes. can just save the kids, and oh, yeah. that's going to have impact on all of society. Yeah, so one of the first uh, studies that the company that we're working with is running is a treatment for Alzheimer's. Okay. And that's really important to see if we can actually get better cognitive function out of people who are suffering from Alzheimer's. And actually, it, it just trickles down effects from there. We have one patent in for a therapy that would have to go still through early studies, but it's a gene therapy that promotes the production of a protein that stem cells promote. And so when we looked at patients who were going through stem cell treatment that had ALS, they had these real benefits to stem cell treatment, but they were short-lived. 
we are looking to see if we can upregulate the protein that we think they're benefiting from in stem cells, but permanently for patients who would be at permanent risk for the rest of their life of the myelin sheath uh, disorder. So, I mean, we are, we are working as quickly as we can, but you know, money, more money has to come into research and development to create the reality of these treatments coming to people. Are these investments uh, in private entities or they're a, uh, a tax write-off benefit? How does that work with uh, bringing the monies and the funds in? So there are nonprofit uh, organizations that uh, don't work directly with us, but they're also working on aging, like the Max Life Foundation and the SENS Foundation. And if people want to donate for a tax deduction, they definitely should go there. We're a private company, and we take in private investors. Um, we have a private mission, and you know we don't want our mission derailed at all. Where we have got big aspirations and big ideas, <laughs> and so uh, we'll probably stay a private company. How do they locate you, Liz? Oh, we're at bioviva-science.com, so you can come right to the website. Next month, we're going to start offering genomic testing and genomic counseling, which is really exciting, and it's going to play into our bioinformatics platform. We're going to hopefully start offering some methylation testing as well, so we can get as close to our DNA to age as possible. We hope that gets people excited about their future of taking therapies, and if they're in our database and they take a therapy, those are a couple less tests that they need to take. <laughs> so the methylization is an important process where there's over a billion chemical reactions per second the body undergoes. And so this byproduct of, of energy metabolism generated from oxygen and the Krebs cycle, these things then have to have a way to, as they decline with age, we have to have a way to kind of keep that body, that energy, that uh, ability to produce energy at a high level. Yeah, so that, that's when you're looking at something like PGC1 alpha. So that's a that's a gene. So let, let's put things in perspective. We used to think of a fast metabolism in a short life. We looked at a mouse and per gram of weight compared to a human, it has a seven times faster metabolism. It only lives for a couple of years. And then we realized that one of its very close cousins, the bat, we used to say you add wings, wings and you add lifespan has the upregulation and overavailability of PGC1 alpha, it lives to 41 years, even though their metabolism is the same. Wow. So a gene, one gene, can make a lot of difference. That's tremendous because I often hear that argument as you pointed out. Oh, if you intervene with biological hormones and growth hormone, the testosterone, the DHA, and you optimize it, of course you want to follow a healthy diet and exercise and do all the right things and quality of sleep, but you know, you're going to shorten uh, the length at which the camel burns. It's going to go faster. So what you're saying is it's quite likely that this intervention of gene therapy and the combination of therapies will most likely extend not just the quality of life, but potentially lengthen it beyond what we ever thought possible. That, that is possible. First, what we need to do is lengthen a human healthy health span, and then we can show evidence. So if you're healthy, what do you die of? So what we're trying, you know, we what would you die of? Well, you could have an accident, you know, something can always get in your way. But we're trying to create the combination of genes that will create homeostasis in the body so it clears the damage as fast as it accumulates the damage. And we start to beg very interesting questions at that point, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> well, fantastic. Liz, um, give your website again, and uh, let's move toward that goal of looking at a long, long, Okay, that's uh, bioviva-science.com and you can find us there and you can uh, actually find our partners who, who are doing the studies now that actually will help pioneer the technology for the future, which we want you to be part of. And uh, only together can we get the job done. It's just a fact. Any final words uh, that you want to leave our audience with? Have a really wonderful life. <laughs> I can't think of anything. It's all good. Like Goodbye, everyone. Be strong, be well, and please uh, share this uh, with your friends. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was awesome. All right, wonderful. On race. Very